Chow Stack visiting us today. Seth obtained his bachelor's degree from Princeton and obtained his PhD degree from Caltech. And Seth is currently working at the SETI Institute. Seth is an expert on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and he's the former director of, uh, director of Center for the uh, SETI research. And Seth is also committed to outreach activities. And he has won the Carl Sagan Award and the Clum Roberts Award. Today, he's going to tell us about exciting uh, things of the search for SETI. OK, thank you very much, Gongji. Um, one never wants a complimentary <laughs> introduction such as Gongji has given you, because, of course, the speaker can never live up to that. What you really want is a speaker or somebody who comes in and says, OK, we just found this guy on the street. He's going to talk to you for a while. <laughs> so you should look at it that way. Um, I must say, there's a, a, more people than I expected in this, this room. So. Uh, you know, I, I notice that many of you are toward the back. That's a good idea because you can get out quickly. I don't know if you want to uh, sort of dim the lights a little bit to spare you the aesthetic offense of looking at me. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about SETI. SETI is one of these interesting disciplines, if you consider it a discipline, one of these interesting disciplines where there are essentially no data. It isn't to say there are no data. There are plenty of data, but they're all noise so far, right? So it's exploration. It isn't like uh, typical research where you have some sort of hypothesis you're trying to prove either. Uh, what is SETI? Oh, what is SETI? That's a good question. Well, well, if you don't know that, you're probably in the wrong room. <laughs> How many other people don't know what SETI is? The cook is in this room. <laughs> the cook is in this room. OK, so it was one other person. I want you to know. Uh, SETI, that's, it's almost my name, actually, but it's actually the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So this is different than astrobiology, which is what most of the people where I work do, where they're looking for life, but they're looking for life on places like Mars, the moons of Jupiter, the moons of Saturn. There's seven other places in the solar system where you might be able to find life because, you know, the conditions for life are there. And you can get to them by rocket. That's not true if you're talking about intelligence. And let me just short circuit the usual question. Well, uh, what do you mean by intelligence, right? Uh, you know, is there intelligence inside the beltway? I mean, people ask this all the time. Uh, the answer is, if you can build a radio transmitter, then from our point of view, you're intelligent. Okay, so you should probably nudge the person sitting next to you and ask them, hey, can you build a radio transmitter? <laughs> and you know how to treat them over the course of your career at Georgia Tech. Okay, uh, let me just, I'm just gonna present some ideas for you, as I say. There are no results. People ask me at parties occasionally. Everything's green here. This must be because you're on the eastern seaboard. Um, people ask me, have you found ET? Right? It's a kind of a silly question because if it were true, if we'd found ET, I wouldn't be here in Atlanta. I'd be in Stockholm collecting a prize and a lot of money. Right? So that's clearly not the case. We haven't found ET yet. And in fact, we haven't found compelling evidence for any life beyond Earth. So as far as we know, uh, this is the only planet with biology, and beyond that, you're the smartest things in the universe, something you probably already believe. Um, but you only believe it because for the first 10 years of your life, you know, your parents were telling you this. Might not be true. Okay, this is the uh, instrument that we use for SETI. This is what's called the Allen Telescope Array Allen. That's not Woody Allen, despite your hopes. That's Paul Allen. Paul Allen was the co-founder of Microsoft. You may have heard of Bill Gates, his partner. But in fact, it was Paul Allen who gave the money to construct this beginning of an array. There are 42 antennas. It's located in Northern California in a place that I just learned last week is very dangerous because there are volcanoes that may go off at any moment. There are earthquakes at any moment. Uh, so it's a dangerous place. But on the other hand, we can't afford to move it anywhere. Okay, it's built up there for historical reasons that really shouldn't interest you. Each of these things is about six meters across. So these are antennas that if you put them in the backyard, your neighbors would complain. They're big enough to, to be that. We use them as a team. This is an interferometer, so uh, they, they're not, ex you know, there's some broken ones that are looking in different directions, but they all point in the same direction. We use it for about 12 hours every day, and the whole idea is simple. Can you find a radio signal coming from the sky that is not due to us, but due to something else? And if it's a narrow, of course you can do that. That's radio astronomy. But if you can find a signal that's what's called narrow band, in other words, at one spot on the radio dial, then you can say, I don't know what that is, Bob, but it's not natural, right? 
It's not something produced by nature, it's produced by a transmitter, and consequently we have some cosmic company. Now you may wonder about that narrow band, what does that mean? Because many people think we look for, you know, coded signals. Oh, here's the value of pi, or here's the Fibonacci series, or something like that. Right? <laughs> because the aliens read Dan Brown novels or something. <laughs> well, I mean, that would be kind of disappointing to begin with. I mean, suppose you finally find the aliens and they tell you the value of pi, something you learned in the seventh grade. You would be disappointed, okay? And then they're not going to waste time on that. They're going to do a other things, I assume. But we don't even look for that. Because this instrument integrates signals. And those of you who do research know what that means. They average the incoming cosmic static, such as it is, for minutes at a time. Okay, that increases the signal to noise. It's like making a time exposure with your camera on a mountaintop, if you have any here in Atlanta. So you can see this city at night. Okay, and the longer you expose, the fainter stuff you can see. But all the temporal information, right, the stoplights that are going on and off, all of that gets thrown away. Okay. So if they are sending us the value of pi or maybe their you know, encyclopedia or maybe the cure for death or, or something else you might find interesting, all of that has gone away. The idea is first to find that there's a signal. If you find a signal, as I discussed with some of the faculty members here today, you would get real money, really smart people would come in to this uh, uh, effort and they would build a much bigger instrument, and when I mean much bigger, four orders of magnitude bigger, and then you might be able to look for the message, right? You know, join our book club, whatever the Klingons are saying, all right? So the idea here is just to find a signal and then you can go to Sweden. And as I've already mentioned, I show this only because I like reading books about polar exploration. Here's Antarctica. You can see the local residents there. SETI is not like traditional science. If you make a prediction about what happens when two you know, black holes get close to one another, you can go to the telescopes maybe and verify that, some instrument. Okay? But with SETI, you can make a, a prediction, oh, there must be somebody out there. Maybe they're doing something we can find, but you can't falsify that hypothesis. The fact that you haven't found anything, and that's the case, the fact that you haven't found anything, that doesn't mean anything. There's lots of ways ET could be out there, but we don't pick them up. Lots of ways. So this is exploration. The idea is like sending Captain Cook into the Pacific in the 1770s, right? The British Admiralty sends into the South Pacific, find the islands, find the cultures, find something, right? And, you know, he, he probably missed 90% of the items of the islands. And if he hadn't found anything, if he had just found water, you know, he'd come back, maybe he'd lose his job, but, you know, he didn't prove anything by not finding anything. It just means he didn't find anything. And the same is true with SETI. There's no way to prove the aliens aren't out there. All you can hope to do is prove that they are. Okay. Now, one thing that's very controversial in this field, there are many things that are controversial, mostly having to do with the personalities of the people involved, but one thing that's quite controversial is the question of not life elsewhere. For some people that might be controversial, but most people in the field figure, oh, biology, that's easy to get going. Now, I, I just heard some people telling me that isn't true. But even so, the really hard thing is making intelligent life, okay? Because if I give you a million planets and they've, they've all got some sort of microbes going around and you let them sit there for four or five billion years, how many of them will ever produce organisms that are capable of getting into Georgia Tech, right? And the answer is, we don't know the answer, right? Now, by my definition, if you can build a radio transmitter, you can get into Georgia Tech. And you can see this guy. Here's a guy 30,000 years ago. He's not intelligent yet. Well, maybe he is because he's adding some RAM to his computer there. But if this, <laughs> that guy 30,000 years after this photo was made, you know, he's building radio transmitters. But how do we ever get to that? And we don't know the answer to that, by the way. I mean, we, you, know, you can look at skulls in the museum and say, well, this was a precursor and that was a precursor and so forth. So you see the various species that led to you. But it's very unclear why intelligence became something valuable from nature's point of view. And these are various uh, you know, theories that have been ratcheted up. Do I? No? Yeah. Uh, not only that, there's this bit of evidence that suggests that intelligence might not be so rare. This is actually, this plot is uh, due to Lori Marino, who was working here at Emory, in fact, for a while. And what she did is she uh, plots here. You know, they say every time you show a plot, you lose 10% of the audience. I have, I have 12 plots, so. Okay, what's plotted here are 
the, in, the IQs, if you will, of dolphins and tooth whales, other critters that are considered pretty smart. The smartest thing on Earth two million years ago was a dolphin. Okay? Now, the way this plot works, this is time, so that's today. This is 50 million years ago, and this is IQ from dumb to smart. Okay? And you can see that 50 million years ago, these critters were not terribly bright. Then they invented echolocation. They got a little bit smarter. Or maybe they just had bigger brains because they needed to find things by echoing. And then some of them got dumber again and some of them got smarter again. But the point is that dolphins are considered today very smart. I had a girlfriend who studied dolphins for a while and she was always telling me how smart they were. Uh, mind you, you can go to the local library and look under dolphin literature. It's not a very extensive collection. So I'm not sure how smart they are, but whatever. The point is we're not the only animals on Earth who have gotten smarter. So it sounds like there maybe there's some, uh, some reason to get smarter. Then there's this picture. That, let me explain this. There's a guy at New Mexico uh, University, Jeff Miller, and he's written several books about the evolution of intelligence in humans. And he thinks it's all due to our dating behavior, right? In the case of humans, as it is the case for many, uh, if you will, complex species, the males display and the females decide, okay? Uh, as I think most people in the room know and certainly will agree with, in the case of humans, men are merely a genetic experiment being run by women, okay? Which immediately makes me wonder, is this what they wanted to select for? I, I always wonder that about it. Is this the best you could do, women? I mean, look around at the guys. Anyhow, so what Miller was saying is this. Most species, if you consider, for example, peacocks, that's a canonical example, uh, you know, a uh, uh, peahen is standing around and some male, some peacock shows up and he shows all these big blue feathers. And so she takes a look at the feathers and says, well, that's a pretty good display, but this guy over here, he's got better blue feathers, right? And she takes that one home to mom. And the question is why? What's in it for her, right? And the answer is what's in it for her is that by growing those blue feathers, he's shown that he has rather few mistakes in the genome and the chicks will be healthy. Okay, that's it. Not interested in blue feathers per se, but they're an indicator into a pretty healthy genome. Now, so what he says, all right, you extend this to Homo sapiens, and of course we don't have blue feathers, but it turns out that the human brain is rather tightly connected to the genome. There are a lot of things in the genome that affect the development of your brain. So the best strategy for males, Homo sapien males, would be to go to parties, take off their skulls, you know, and pass their brains around to all the women, say, hey, check it out. And, you know, but that's considered a social blunder. So that's not the what happens. So the women are listening to the guys and saying, yeah, well, you know, hey, Ralph here, he's pretty interesting, but Sydney over here, he's more interesting. And he gets taken home. And it's not because the women are interested in intelligent guys. They only think that, but it's not true. What they're really interested in is that the genome doesn't have too many errors. So this guy, who clearly doesn't have too many errors, this guy's very popular, right? Okay. Now, you can believe this or not believe it. There, there are votes on both sides of that issue. But the point is, if any mechanism like this is true, then intelligence is just part of the Darwinian system, and it's going to happen frequently. Okay, you can buy it or not. Now, how we're looking for ET has changed since the first experiment was done using this antenna in lovely West Virginia, 85-foot diameter antenna used by Frank Drake, a guy who's still active in the field, by the way. It's very odd to work in a, in a research field where the guy who pioneered it is still coming into the office, right? Uh, he used this antenna for two weeks. He pointed at a couple of nearby stars hoping to pick up something. He didn't. Well, that's not quite true. He did pick up something. In fact, uh, within a couple of days of starting the experiment, and he, his first reaction was, could it be this easy? Right. Well, it turns out it was the U.S. military, which didn't count. Okay. <laughs> but what has changed in the last 60 years of the technology and the science, let me tell you a little bit about either of those, or both of those. This is the equipment that Frank Drake used in 1960. Uh, familiar to me, it looks like the stuff I used as a grad student. But anyhow, so there's all this stuff. And it's a receiver. It already existed at the observatory. That way, it didn't offend management by spending money. Um, and it could listen to one channel at a time, one frequency, one spot on the radio dial at a time. Okay? Uh, and he would, he would sweep over the dial by having a little motor with some rubber bands on it or something that would turn the dial of the receiver, right? Pretty simple. And that might sound like a good strategy, except that that means you're spending all your time listening to the wrong stations if you will. It's like in your 
you know, you're driving around in your car at night and you want some entertainment. I know you want to find that country and western station that most of you listen to. And so, you know, you could sit there turning the knob if you have a knob, uh, turning the knob, but then, you know, you're spending all your time listening to the wrong frequency. Okay. So this is good, but what you really want is a receiver that can listen to many channels at once. And this is the difference in the kind of technology that's available. This is the technology we use today. Paul knows all about this sort of stuff. This particular receiver monitors 72 million channels simultaneously. So that's what we use. This is obviously a man's dream, right? Because you don't ruin your marriage by clicking through all the channels all the time and offending your wife. You can listen to 72 million at once. But they're very narrow band, so you don't get very good programming. Anyhow, so this is it. This is what's at the Allen Telescope Array. It has to be there because we cannot afford to send the data anywhere else, right? You have to analyze it real time in place. Okay, that's a change in the technology. And that's perhaps the biggest change in this whole field that today the experiment is maybe 14 orders of magnitude faster than it was back in 1960. The other thing we're doing is, uh, you know, trying to apply deep learning to this problem. Uh, I think many of you know about deep learning, artificial intelligence. As you know, I think they took 14,000 microprocessors, ganged them all together, and let them loose on the Internet. Say, see if you can find anything in the Internet. And it turns out they were able to find things on the Internet, namely cats. Okay. And they, I think they found like a million cats, you know, in videos, photos, and so forth. Now, I don't know how useful that is. Maybe if you're in the cat food industry, it is useful. But yeah, so this machine now is better at recognizing cats than you are, right? It can find cats that you can't find in a, in a video or a picture. Okay. I, 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 it may be better than cats at recognizing cats. I don't know. But in any case, you might say, well, that's totally useless. But the point is that this technology, of course, is being used for all sorts of things. And in particular, this is the kind of signal we're looking for in SETI. But, you know, we made an assumption that that's what we're looking for in SETI. This is a relatively narrow band signal. So this is frequency here. That's time that way. So you can see it only occupies a tiny part of this already very tiny part of the spectrum. It's a little noisy, but you can see something there. It's drifting because of the rotation of the Earth, changing Doppler shift and all that. But maybe that's not the kind of signal that ET is sending us. And if you have this AI approach, maybe you can find something that you hadn't anticipated. The problem with the receivers we're using today and the analysis we use today is that we've already assumed what the answer should be. And maybe AI can do better than that. All right, here's something else. How the science has changed. We used to look, <laughs> you know, this, this is the way things will look in the future when the, Earth, when the sun expands. Yeah, we used to point the antennas in the direction of sun-like stars. Because, after all, we know of one sun-like star where intelligence is developed. So that's a very conservative approach. And in today's climate of politics, we figured a conservative approach is probably appropriate. But, on the other hand, only one in eight stars is like the sun. Right? Much, you know, much greater number of stars are smaller than the sun. So, like this one here, it's a red dwarf. Okay? Those of you who are into astronomy may have heard of red dwarfs. They're just stars smaller than the sun. They're usually not this much smaller. Some of them may be you know, 80% the diameter of the sun or whatever. But the output of a star that's smaller depends very strongly, something like fourth or fifth power, on, on the mass. So when you go to a smaller star, even though it's only 20% you know, or 30% smaller, it's much, much dimmer. So these red dwarfs are kind of the dim bulbs of the universe. Always <laughs> I always thought that was my brother's, but it's not true. Okay, so the dim bulbs of the universe, and you might say, why look at those? Well, part of it is because three quarters of all stars are red dwarfs. So there are a lot more of them. And if you're looking at a finite sample of star systems, if you look at, for example, red dwarfs, on average, they're going to be closer. If you can only look at 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000, on average, they're going to be closer by a considerable amount, uh, you know, a factor of two closer. Right? I mean, this would be like going to a school where, you know, 80% of the students were, I don't know, men, for example. And um, that means that the average distance to the nearest thousand guys would be less than the average distance to the nearest thousand women, right? Okay, so that's an advantage. If it's a factor two closer on average, then the signals will be, you know, factor four stronger. The other thing is that thanks to Kepler and other investigations, mostly Kepler, we know that a lot of these red dwarfs have planets, and they have planets that are really close in so that they're warm enough, even though that's a pretty dim star, they're warm enough that you could have liquid oceans, atmosphere, and all that sort of thing. And the other thing is that they're long-lived. 
They're so dim that they, it takes them 100 billion years to run out of fuel. The sun has 10 billion years. So that you know, means that on average, every red dwarf, well, not on average, every red dwarf ever formed in the universe is still out there enjoying its teenage years now. Okay. Now, this is one example I can think of where older might be better. Because, because they're older, maybe they've cooked up something interesting. They've had more time to do that. So that's why we're looking at a lot of these things. Uh, this is just, uh, uh, it's just, it looks like <laughs> a fingerprint. But this is, in fact, the location of the nearest uh, 20,000 red dwarfs, which are what we're looking at. So we're looking at 20,000 of them. It'll take us a couple years to do that. And over certain parts of the radio dial, we can't cover the entire dial, but a lot of them. So that's the survey we're doing now. Um, Will it turn up ET? I don't know, but I think it's a better experiment than what we did in the past. Here's an example of a special target, because we do those too. This is a system that uh, was discovered about two years ago by a group led out of, I think it was the, um, I think it was in Leuven, in any case, in Belgium. And uh, the, it's a red dwarf star, and it's known to have at least six planets, seven planets, uh, in the habitable zone of that star. In other words, at the right radius from that star, where water could neither be frozen all the time or boiling all the time. And uh, they're all about Earth's size, by the way. That's, that's different than our own solar system. They're not all about Earth's size. Uh, it's called Trappist-1 because there's a beer in Belgium known as Trappist beer. Uh, it's actually named after a monastery, but be that as it may. In any case, so this is interesting because it isn't very far away. It's 49 light years away. That's about what I have on the odometer of my Honda, right? So that's not too far. 49 light years away means the signals might be stronger, so we've been looking at that. I'm going to skip that. Here's, um, in fact, this is just a representation I made, but here are these, you know, six or seven planets of the Trappist-1 system, and we happen to know, you know, the, uh, the orbital parameters well enough that we can say when one of those planets gets in front of another planet. You might think, well, what's the point of that? The point is, when they're lined up like that, from our point of view, then you're looking down the communications pipeline if there is one, between the inhabitants here and the inhabitants there. This is actually a very interesting system. This would be great for a sci-fi movie or sci-fi story, because if life gets cooked up on any of these planets, you can be sure it spreads to the others, right? Because it isn't very far from one planet to the next. These are all, you know, a few million miles apart from the next one. This is not like in our solar system. You can go out tonight and, you know, look for Venus in the night sky or, or Saturn, Jupiter, Mars. They're up there, but they look like little points of light. If you were in one of these planets, right, you'd look up and you'd see the nearest other planets. They would look like balls hanging in the sky, the way they do in the movies. Okay. And whereas if you want to go to Mars this weekend, and I know some of you are planning, to do that, it takes you six or seven months to get there with a NASA rocket, right? Well, here, it would take you the weekend with that same rocket. Okay. So life would spread to all these things. So looking at this thing, you're not just looking at an, maybe another inhabited world. You're looking at an inhabited ecosystem. So I think that's kind of interesting. All right. We've looked at this thing, and this will give you some idea of the number that comes out of this. You could hear from them. You, we would have picked up something if they have an arecibo size antenna, which they might or might not have, and a transmitter power of 300 kilowatts. That's less than the actual Arecibo uh, transmitter has, in fact. So in other words, with the kind of technology we have, 100 years after Marconi, they could transmit to us a signal that we could pick up. We haven't found anything, but uh, yeah, we do do that. All right. There's another project being conducted by the University of California, Berkeley. And they actually have some real money, thanks to a Russian billionaire by the name of Yuri Milner, who's given them $10 million a year for a decade. It's real money. And so they're using existing antennas, uh, such as the Green Bank Telescope, which is uh, you know, on the order of uh, 100 meters across, like that. And uh, they're using it to look at other nearby stars. So there's that whole project going on, too. And there's also what's called optical SETI, where forget the radio. I get emails, phone calls every day from people. Most of them are calling up to tell me that they've had some difficulty in their personal lives from aliens. Uh, I don't know how the statistics are in this room, but one third of the American population believes that the aliens are not only out there, but they're here, right? Occasionally hauling people out of their bedrooms. Okay, why would they would come this far to do that? I don't know, but maybe you have good ideas. 
But maybe they're not using radio at all. That's what other people say, radio is so old school, right? They won't use radio. And so I always write back and say, okay, what do you suggest? And usually they suggest hyperdimensional physics or subspace communication or something else they've seen on television. But the facts are that if they, maybe they are, I mean, who, know, who knows what they're doing, but we can't do an experiment using subspace communication unless I can go to the Georgia Tech bookstore and find a textbook on subspace communication, which will allow me to build some equipment, right? So it's totally useless. But we do do things other than radio, such as this experiment. This is Shelley Wright when she was an undergrad at uh, UC Santa Cruz. I think that's where she was. Anyhow, this is just a box with a bunch of photomultipliers tubes in it, looking for very short laser flashes from the sky. That's another way to do it. And here's actually a proposal. This hasn't been funded yet, but it only costs 700 million, so maybe one of the better off students could fund this, uh, to build the Colossus Telescope. The idea being that it's not a general purpose telescope. You can't use it for much astronomy, but it can look at a very small patch of the sky with tremendous sensitivity because it has a 74 meter aperture. And the idea is to look at star systems or galaxies and look for those super civilizations that have been around for, you know, more than our society, more than Earth has been around, you know, maybe 10 billion years, look for them and see if they've modified their entire galaxy or their entire star system in such a way that we can actually see waste heat or something else. So that's this idea. I, you know, we asked him, where are you going to get the $700 million? He said, not a problem. I don't know what that means, but OK, not a problem. Um, well, we're also building something. All right, here's the, the, the central question. I want to leave enough time for you guys to ask the questions you know I'm deliberately not approaching. Uh, and that is, are we closer to finding the aliens? All right, so here it's 1492. And if you could get aboard the Santa Maria here, you could go up to Chris Columbus and you could say, all right, Chris, uh, what's the deal? Are we any closer to discovering something? And I suppose that what Chris would say, I mean, I have no idea, but what he would probably say, probably in Portuguese or Spanish, he would say, well, no, I haven't discovered anything. And in fact, that's not his job. He wasn't actually trying to discover anything. But anyhow, he would say, nope, nope. Uh, all we saw around the ship today was water. And by the way, yesterday when we looked around the ship was just water. And the day before that, it was fairly aqueous in the vicinity of the ship. Okay. So, you know, that's going to be the answer. It's going to be no, 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 no. And then one day, he said, well, wait a minute. We, we see some land ahead, right? So that's the way SETI is. People ask, all right, have you found anything? No. Are you close? I find that a very peculiar question. Are you close? I mean, how do you know if you're close? Chris wouldn't have known if he was close. And he would have had a better idea than we do, right? It's like, it's, this is a one-bit experiment. It's zero until it's one. Okay, step function there. I mean, it's like asking, are you pregnant? No. Are you close? What does that mean? I don't know what it means. OK. Uh, maybe it means something. <laughs> I don't know. But anyhow, so there, that's what this is. It's still zero. Uh, now, here are some study experiments. Can we predict when we might actually find something? Well, I think that this is, this is a relevant thing to point out. Um, these are the typical sensitivities for a recent SETI experiment. And there's a whole bunch of numbers here, but the only ones to pay attention to are the ones in this last column. How powerful would the Klingon's transmitter have to be in order for us to pick something up? Okay, and for the, the, the three of you who can actually read these numbers, they're between 10 to the 11, 10 to the 13 watts. That's if they put all the energy into a narrow band, one hertz wide. If they put it into a wider band, then you've got to multiply these numbers by the width of the band. So they go up. All right. Now, those numbers are very comparable to the total amount of energy burned by Homo sapiens today. Right. Today, the, the total energy uses, uh, usage of all humans is roughly 10 to the 13 watts. Right. That's all the cars, the computers, right, the electric toothbrushes, it's roughly 10 to the 13 watts. So that's what these numbers are like, if not you know, if you assume that they're broadcasting some information, it would be even more. That's a lot of energy, right? Uh, that might be a lot, even for a Klingon, that much energy. That would be a big, big experiment. That's not a high, high school science fair project, right? So the question is, would they do that? How can we beat that if we can't even detect an experiment that has sensitivities that don't require them to spend this much money on energy? Do we have any hope? Uh, what would be a reasonable expenditure on transmitting? I don't know. I mean, you can't ask the Klingons because they don't answer. 
But you might consider this experiment. You probably heard of this experiment. All right, here's the Large Hadron Collider. It's a big experiment. The physicists have justified this. And it runs on average. I mean, it's very intermittent, the energy usage. But on average, it's running at 2.5 megawatts. 2.5 megawatts to find the Higgs boson or whatever they're going to find. Now, that's 10 to the minus 7th of total world energy usage by homo sapiens. So you just take that number and say, OK, that's what they're going to use. Now, 10 to the minus 7, how does that compare with the amount of energy that an advanced society might have? Well, consider Earth. The total amount of you know, insulation, that is to say, the total amount of sunlight falling on the Earth is on the order of 10 to the 17 watts. Okay? So if you do anything on Earth where you burn more than 1% of that, you release so much heat into the atmosphere that you really destroy the climate. I know you think we're destroying the climate now, but that's nothing compared to if you exceeded this amount of energy burn. We're at like 1% of that now. Okay? So, I mean, not, not 1%, we're, we're like a thousandth of, a, uh, of that number, we're at 10 to the 13 watts. So if you go above 10 to the 15th watts or something, then you really, really, really wreck the, the climate. So take that as the maximum amount of energy available on this planet, right? That might be, might be wrong, but let's, let's take that. And if you say, okay, we're going to put 10 to the minus 7th of it into this experiment, where we beam messages out into space, hoping to get new members for our book club. Okay? Well, that means that the, you know, the amount that the uh, Klingons have available for their transmitting projects is on the order of 100 million watts. And we can't find that. We can't find that. So uh, three or four orders of magnitude below what we can do today. So what's the solution to that? What do you do? Do, you just, you know, do I take a job changing the oil in transmissions or something? becoming a weight guesser on the boardwalk in Santa Cruz, what? Well, here are some options. One, you could wait 200 years until we have much bigger antennas, uh, by my reckoning, and that's this plot in the back here. We're increasing the sensitivity of radio telescopes by on the order of two orders of magnitude per century. So in 200 years, we'll have you know, four orders of magnitude bigger antennas. That may happen. That may happen. The trouble is, if you wait 200 years to detect the aliens, I have to say my personal interest in the project will be somewhat attenuated. <laughs> Not only that, but you, know, you can imagine your funding has gone away or whatever. I don't know. All right, so that's one option, but it's obviously not a very attractive one. You could just narrow your scrutiny to nearby systems. We certainly try and do that already, where you know, then the energy requirements for the people at the other end, the things at the other end, becomes lower. But on the other hand, if you say, I'm only going to look at stuff that's within 50 light years is a problem, because there aren't that many stars within 50 light years, and your chance of hitting one that's occupied might not be very big. Uh, you could consider aliens that have bigger systems. They have more energy available. Do most of you know what a Dyson sphere is? Anybody heard about Dyson spheres? Is Freeman Dyson in the audience? OK, you don't count. But all right, uh, well, I'll tell you what that is in a moment. But these, these people who can get access to much, much larger amounts of energy than we do. You could also look to, for something that's actually easy to generate, but very intermittent, like a flashing laser light. Right? If there was a laser pointer aimed our way, sending a pulse, maybe a millisecond long, who knows, right? uh, in, in the constellation of Cassiopeia tonight, do you think anybody would see it? Right? Nobody would see it. Nobody would know it was there, because the astronomers are not looking there. And they're certainly not looking for something that's only a millisecond long in general. Right? So it could be that there's been a green flash in the constellation of Cassiopeia or some other place, been going on for tens of thousands of years, and nobody has ever noticed it. But that's changing because we're developing the technologies to look for that sort of thing. And if you found it, if you, if you say, Ralph, there's a green flash occurring in Cassiopeia. It was only a millisecond long, but I saw it two weeks ago, and I saw it two weeks before that, too. You would spend whatever money you could get your hands on to study that region in space. So maybe they, they had that strategy. Maybe that is a high school science fair project. Somebody's corralled a really big laser, and they're, they're running it with a, a laptop, and they're just pinging the nearest million star systems with this flash every two weeks, hoping to elicit a response. And maybe that flash will tell you where to you know, build a really big antenna and listen for the, the message. Right? Maybe they are sending us their internet. This is uh, the other idea, the Dyson sphere. Uh, Freeman Dyson, a very clever physicist, 
British and American. He's worked in both places. Anyhow, he said, look, if you really want a lot of energy and you don't want to pollute the atmosphere, here's what you do about it. You just take apart something like Neptune or something. <laughs> you know, Neptune's probably not big in your life. I don't know. If it is big in your life, get help. Uh, but you, you take it apart and you build this big sphere, well, maybe not a sphere. You break up the sphere into pieces. It's dynamically a little better. But you do that. You cover the inside with solar cells. Okay. So you collect all the, the, you know, all the energy coming off the sun. You could conceivably get all 4 times 10 to the 26 watts, whatever the number is, of the sun's output. Turn it into energy, even at 10% efficiency, 1% efficiency, doesn't matter. There's so much energy coming out there. And then you can send it back to Earth on a microwave beam, right? And now you get all this energy, as much as you can possibly use. There's no pollution. You haven't burned anything. You've got a big capital cost here. But there's not much in the way of running costs, right? It just keeps sending you more energy. No, no pollution, nothing like that. Not burning anything, OK? And so maybe there are really advanced societies that haven't done the complete sphere, but they've covered maybe 1% or 0.01% or 0.001% of their star with something like this. And you can find them because, in fact, this stuff on the outside is emitting some infrared. Right? That's just sophomore thermodynamics. got to happen. And you can find you know, that, that infrared. A couple of years ago, there was a big story about this star, KIC 8462852, better known as Tabby Star, because uh, Tabitha here, and I won't try and pronounce her last name. She's incapable of doing that, apparently. Anyhow, uh, she was a postdoc, I think, at Yale. Anyhow, she found this in the Kepler data. So this is a, a plot of how bright this star is. And you can see, you know, for a couple of days here, it got really dim, 22% dimmer. You don't see that with the sun. I don't know how many of you go out every day and look at the sun to see if it's gotten any dimmer. Uh, probably only do that once or twice. But you would find that the sun doesn't change brightness very much, maybe 0.01%. There's a big sunspot group or something like that. The sun's output is very, very constant. This star got 22% dimmer. That's not a planet going in front of that star. No planet would be big enough to do this. Right? And it's not periodic anyhow. So it's not a planet. What is it? And a fellow at Penn State, and I know that Georgia Tech is considered the Penn State of the South. I think uh, I was told that this afternoon uh, by the name of uh, Jason Wright, actually, was the name of the guy. He said, you know what this could be? This could be a Dyson sphere. It's not finished yet. And of course, it's sort of rotating. And every now and then, a big piece of it gets in front of that star. This is an alien megastructure, structure, structure. OK. And of course, the media picked up on that right away. They got really excited. All right, scientists discover alien engineering in space, which would be astoundingly interesting, right? Um, it turns out it's probably not true. You know, There's been a lot of attention paid to this. We, we actually looked at it with the Allen Telescope Array. We didn't get any signals. But on the other hand, this star is pretty far away. It's like 1,400 light years away. So it would be very hard to get a signal. But still. It turns out it's probably not an alien megastructure because of the, the, the dimming, which has been seen again. It, uh, it shows color variation that indicates that what's causing this is dust. There's some dust in that system that occasionally gets in front of the star. But still, this is a legitimate approach. Here it is, you know, as hypothesized at uh, State College, Pennsylvania, okay, that this thing gets in front of the star and you get a 22% dimming or whatever. This could be, this may be a better way to find ET than looking for those radio waves, because this doesn't require them to be aiming any signal in your direction. Okay, that big advantage. The other thing you could do is look in the center of the galaxy. Uh, that may be where all the action is, because the really advanced aliens have gone 28,000 light years in this direction to take advantage of the big black hole there. They could validate all the theories that are cooked up in this department here. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the density of material there is. You know, I, the stellar density is like a million times greater than it is around here. There's a lot of stuff there, a lot of energy. If you're really an advanced alien, maybe this is where you want to be. And that brings me to, I'm not going to talk about this either. Here's a suggestion for how to find the really advanced aliens. Instead of looking for the kinds of things we've been looking for, you know, signals, technology, stuff like that, Try and figure out what really, really advanced societies would do. Forget the guys that are only 10,000 years more advanced than we are. You can imagine what they might be interested in doing. 
But, you know, even 10,000 is, is pretty advanced. I mean, if you'd asked Julius Caesar 2,000 years ago, hey, Julius, what do you think people are going to be doing 2,000 years from now? And, you know, what sort of weapons are they going to have? What are, well, they will really have refined the spear and stuff like that. You know, you get it completely wrong. All right. But maybe you could say something about societies that are only thousands of years more advanced. But maybe you can't say anything useful about a society that's a million or a billion years more advanced. Except that one thing you know that they will be, may be concerned about is the fact that the universe is destined for doom. Right? Those of you who have studied a little bit of cosmology know what the future of the universe is going to be. I mean, you may not know what they're going to serve in the student center tomorrow for lunch, but you do know the long-term consequences. Namely, all the stars are going to burn out in about roughly a trillion years. Most of them will be gone, right? Then eventually the galaxies will turn into central black holes because of collision, so forth and so on. Maybe the protons decay. I mean, all sorts of things like this can be predicted, but the universe never stops, right? As far as we know, the universe isn't going to you know, collide, uh, collapse in on itself. It seems like it's just going to keep expanding forever. So there's no end to this, right? Just go on, go on forever. So if you're really an advanced alien and you'd like to keep your culture alive indefinitely, you've got to deal with this problem. The fact that the universe has a bomb under it that's going to go off, it's going to self-destruct, and maybe you want to do something about that. So there are people who point out things like this. This is the size of the universe as a function of time, measured with meter sticks, whatever. So here's the Big Bang, and here's today. The universe is not only expanding, but most of you know, the expansion is accelerating, right? This was Nobel Prize material 10 years ago. I, it, it, you know, it's getting bigger, faster, and faster. Okay. Uh, but when did it start accelerating? Well, that happened, you know, maybe 7 billion years after the Big Bang. That's long enough that there could be somebody in the universe there that would have the ability to maybe change the universe somehow, left to the student, okay? So suddenly the acceleration began then. Well, I think that's just coincidence, and there's evidence that it is just coincidence, or if not coincidence, due to something natural. But still, you could point to something like this. Maybe that's alien work. It sounds like Penn State again. Uh, here's another idea due to this guy, Dan Hooper. He's at Fermi Labs in Illinois, and he says, well, consider this. You're really an advanced alien species. You've been around not for 300,000 years like our species has been around, but you've been around for billions of years. Maybe you're worried about the expansion of the universe to the extent that you realize this is going to take all these sources of energy and matter away from you, so you need to prepare for that, right? You've got to stock up the basement with supplies for the future, otherwise it's going to be bad. So what he's saying is that before the universe expands too far, where you can't get to stuff, you go out and grab stars now. Okay, so here's it's kind of an illustration. You bring these stars from nearby galaxies, or even galaxies that aren't so nearby, while well, you can, and you just put them in a corral somewhere so you can use them later. I think this is an intriguing idea. I think there are problems with it, because how do you get the stars here? That takes energy. And, you know, just the back of the envelope calculation suggests that the amount of energy required is kind of like the total amount of energy put out by the star over its lifetime. So that sounds like it's kind of a stupid thing to do. It takes as much gasoline to get the car into the parking lot as you, know, you would be able to then to, to use. So, but anyhow, this is just the kind of thinking that people are spending, it seems, more and more time on these days. What would really an advanced society do? So are we closer? I don't know. This is a rough index of how fast SETI experiments are. Uh, there's just some metric that I considered the the number of channels we can look at. So the speed of SETI searches uh, is these white dots since 1960, obviously going up. For the three of you in the audience who are still conscious, you may notice this is a semi-log plot. So it's going up exponentially, right? And in fact, it's just following Moore's law. That's an economic law of the Silicon Valley where I live, which says that every 18 months, every two years, the amount of compute power you can buy for $1,000 double. You know this is true if you live in the Silicon Valley, because if you go to a party, I'm talking a lot about parties. I never get invited to parties. But if you go to a party and, you know, somebody sees your laptop, they ask about it, oh, yeah, I bought this four years ago, then they will, the next thing they are likely to say is, excuse me while I go refresh my drink, right? Because you get no respect if you have a four-year-old laptop because by then it's totally out of date, right? Now, the idea here is not that you can run better applications from you know, Microsoft or somebody, it's just that they want to sell you a new computer because the old one doesn't 
it doesn't wear out. It just gets outdated by Moore's law. So that's an economic law. It's not really technology. But in any case, SETI follows Moore's law because it's mostly computers. So every two years, the experiment you're doing is probably collecting more data, or at least analyzing more data, than all the previous SETI experiments combined. Right. So this is why I have bet everybody in an audience I was talking to in Europe a couple of years ago, I bet everybody a cup of Starbucks that we will find ET within two dozen years. I will extend that invitation to you. I'm buying Starbucks stock, by the way. Uh, so <laughs> that's the idea. So here's the deal for you. Either within two dozen years, you'll open the newspaper. Well, you want to open the newspaper. You open up your browser, right? And you'll see this headline, scientists find signal coming from 727 light years away. And you'll have something to talk to your friends about. Or you get a cup of coffee. So it's not a bad deal. Uh, what if we find a signal just last? This is the question I get most often from the public. They want to know, if you guys found something, would you even tell us? Right? For some reason, Americans love conspiracies. And they think that if we found a signal, you know, the, the government would keep you from knowing. And when I ask why, why would they do that? And the answer is always because the public couldn't handle the news. OK, so this is the assumption that if we found ET, there would be rioting in the streets. Now, I ask you, you're, you know, examples of, uh, of American citizenry. If you found that we had discovered a signal tomorrow, would you say, that's it, Mom. I'm not going to school today. I'm just going to ride in the streets. Now, it's true, maybe 70% of you would say, yes, see, would, would say, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. But most of you would not do that, I think, right? And we know it's not going to happen because here's, that experiment has been run. In 1997, I was at home having dinner, and the phone rings, and it's the boss of the SETI Institute. It's our CEO, Tom, and he says, okay, Seth, I think you ought to get down to the Institute. Now, when your boss tells you to get to work at 6 in the evening, usually it's bad news, and you better plan your next career move. But it, that wasn't the case. What he was saying was that they had found a signal in West Virginia. We were using an antenna there. And all, this, is, this is what was going on. Everybody was sitting there. I made this photo at 3 in the morning. They're all sitting around looking at these monitors because we'd found a signal that looked like the real deal. Right? It was very convincing. And it actually, the reason it was convincing, it turned out to be the uh, SOHO satellite, actually. But the reason it was convincing was because we were using a second antenna in the state of Georgia. You may have heard of that state. That wasn't working because it had a broken axle or something. Paul probably knows what happened. What, what happened with it? Right. When I told Jill, she called me, and I told her it's so because we had a database of all the satellite antennas. Okay, so she knew that it wasn't ET. She knew it was. I told her that, that afternoon, I knew it, you know, could be so. It was a rainy night in Georgia, and all right, whatever. Okay, but the point is, I'm glad that she didn't listen to that very carefully because this meant that we could run this, or we could run this little experiment and see what happens when we, even we think that there's a signal. So I was waiting for the men in black to open the door and come on in. They didn't. I was waiting for the red telephone in the corner to collect it to the White House to ring. It didn't, because we don't have a red telephone. I, you know, I waited for the, uh, <laughs> the mayor of Mountain View to call. He didn't call. I waited for my mom to call. She didn't call. Nobody called. Nobody was interested. And everybody was sending emails. Hey, uh, you know, don't say anything. But we got this rather interesting signal going on here. Finally, at 9.30 in the morning, six hours after I made this photo, I was half asleep at my desk. Maybe I was fully asleep at my desk. The phone finally rang, and it was the New York Times, and they'd already heard about it. Okay. So what this shows is that if we were to find a signal, it isn't that the government would cover it up. They had no interest, no interest whatsoever from any government, including the local government. But the media are very interested. And so my bet to everyone is that if we find a signal, you will read about it first in the checkout line at the supermarket in the, the, those papers that are of dubious uh, quality. Okay, that's it. Uh, here we can turn on the lights and I'll take some questions if you have any. Yes, sir. Uh, so you're monitoring 20,000 stars. I didn't uh, see an estimate of what is the likelihood, given that our civilization will subsist probably for a short period of time. Yeah, you're asking, is 20,000 uh, star system? We don't look at them simultaneously, obviously, it's serially. Right. Is that a large enough sample to give a reasonable chance of success? Things are going without, I don't think they're going to last forever. So if you could 
to that, if you factor that out in, uh, th so that is my first one, if I can ask that second one, there could be also an indirect way of, of finding life. You know? For instance, if we get to a point in which uh, search for exoplanets, uh, we can detect pollution in another planet, planet. They are not sending a signal, but we can probably infer that uh, there is a civilization there, or there was. Okay, well, let me, uh, did, could everybody hear the question or should I repeat it? Anybody want me to repeat it? And we want me to retract it? Okay. The first question, what's the probability that 20,000 is a big enough number? The answer to that is we don't know. Of course we don't know. That's really the Drake equation, if you will. You know, what fraction of stars have planets that are not only habitable, that might be one in five or something like that. That's the best number we have now. But what fraction of them actually produce biology? And the answer to that, again, is we don't know. We don't know. You could say, well, maybe biology is really easy because it got started very quickly on Earth. But that's, you know, that's a sample size of one. So you really don't know anything there. So we don't know that. And we don't know how long they're going to last. I appreciate your optimism about the future of mankind. Uh, that's, that's, that's great. I'm, I'm not so pessimistic. I wrote a little article here recently, you know, let loose all the nuclear weapons, right? And, and you know, how, many, how much of humanity would get wiped out? And it turns out, you know, it would be not a great day but you wouldn't get rid of Homo sapiens. And within you know, 50, 100 years, maybe there'll be people living on Mars or maybe rotating aluminum cans in orbit or something. And at that point, it gets really hard to get rid of all humanity. I think it gets hard. It's like ants. I can get rid of the ants in my kitchen, but I can't get rid of all ants. They're dispersed. Okay, so that's what's going to happen to humanity. So there's this sort of, uh, you know, there, there's this bottleneck where you invent the weapons that might do you a lot of damage, and then you spread out enough that at least the species isn't safe. All right, that's something else. So we don't know. The answer is, but 20,000 is at least a couple of orders of magnitude better than previous searches. So you have to look at it that way. And your second question was, give, give me a hint. Indirect detection. Oh, yeah, right, right. Indirect detection. Yeah, just look for hairspray in the atmosphere of somebody else's planet. Uh, that's, that's a very legitimate thing. There are people, as you know, uh, Sarah Seeger, for example, at MIT, is interested in biomarkers. That's what you're talking about. Not necessarily intelligence markers, though. Those are very hard to find. I mean, if there was a, a, a planet 100 light years away and, you know, there was an advanced society and they were polluting their atmosphere with, you know, chlorofluorocarbons or whatever, it would be very, very, very difficult to ever detect that. What would be much easier and is something that's happening very soon, even now in some sense, uh, is to find oxygen or maybe methane in the atmosphere. Then you know there's biology, or at least you have a good hint that there's biology. But, you know, the Klingons could have looked at the Earth two billion years ago and found all this oxygen and say, well, what do you think? And say, well, maybe there's lettuce there, right? So it doesn't tell you about intelligence. So intelligence is relatively hard to find. If your next door neighbor thinks that they've been abducted by aliens for breeding experiments, it's always breeding experiment. If, if, if you think that's the case, you say, well, how did they know you were here? Right? Very hard to find us if you're more than 70 light years away, actually. Very hard. Anybody else? They, was it so soporific that, yes, sir? So you're searching for signals, but are you also sending signals? Are we sending signals? Yeah, well, not deliberately. I mean, there are people who want to do that, and it has been done. It's called METI messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. And it's very controversial. Uh, one, because maybe the nearest Kling Klingons are 300 light years away, right? You send a signal to them, you luck out, you pick the right star system. Say, hi, uh, we're the Earthlings, and we got all these used cars interested. You know, it takes 300 years to get there. And if they deign to reply, there's another 300 years. So 600 years have gone by now, and then you finally get the answer, you know, please repeat that, whatever. <laughs> Whatever they say, who knows what they say. But, you know, who's going to do an experiment where you have to wait so long for a result? Nobody's interested. Uh, but there are people who think it would be good to do to nearby star systems. Seems unlikely to me because those are rather few, but okay. Uh, nearby star systems uh, to elicit a response. So we have to step up to the plate. That's the argument. I don't know what that means in the cosmic context, but there are people who say that. But there are other people, and they're very vociferous, who think it's a dangerous idea to let the aliens know we're here by broadcasting something deliberately out into space. Even Stephen Hawking weighed in on this thing. Just look what happens when a more advanced society meets a less advanced society. Consider the Americas. It's not good. All that stuff. 
we could talk about that. But I think it's totally academic in this sense, not a good sense, in the bad sense of being irrelevant. It's moot because we have been broadcasting into space ever since the Second World War when we developed high-powered, high-frequency transmitters, namely radar. The strongest signals leaving the Earth are not the local TV station here, but it's the radar at uh, the airport. Okay? And you don't want to turn that off because you're worried the Klingons will find it and come and incinerate the planet. Right? You don't want to turn it off. And you can't just turn it off for a little bit. You can say, okay, we're going we're to turn off these powerful transmitters because it could be dangerous. You'd have to turn them off forever. And who's going to do Nobody's going to do that. It's, I think it's nuts. So uh, there are people who want to broadcast. There are other people who think it's dangerous. I think they're both you know, barking up the wrong arboreal fixture or something. But, yes, ma'am. Yeah, would they be cryptic? Would they be cryptic because they won't broadcast anything into space because it could conceivably be dangerous? I mean, there's no arguing that point. Maybe it is dangerous. You're not going to be the top dog in the galaxy. Whoever you are, you can't assume you're the top dog. I mean, you people do, but, you know, maybe the Klingons not. So, yeah, that they all take steps to hide their activity. Maybe. I mean, I, I don't know how to answer that. That's more a sociological question than anything else. But it does require, at some point, a lot of effort. How do you stop, for example, the radar from Hartsville? Or what is it? Hartsdale? Yeah, Hartsdale. Hart, Hartsfield Jackson. Hartfield Jackson, right. Hartfield Jackson. He was in my 10th grade class. OK, <laughs> Hartfield Jackson. How, how do you shield that from the aliens? You know, what are you going to do? I mean, that's hard, right? So there's that point, just a technical problem. And the other thing is you have to do it forever. <laughs> and I would say that this is very naive, but I think that the universe is kind of niftily constructed in a way that it becomes very, very difficult to pick up a signal from 100 light years away and say, let's go incinerate their planet. You going to vote for that, Senator? It's really expensive, and I don't know what you get out of it. So, I, you know, I don't know. It's sociology. It's alien sociology, even worse. And I have to say the data set for alien sociology is sparse. Yes, I had to hide those slides from you because I didn't know if you were adult enough. Well, it's true. In the case of the red dwarfs, you know, the habitable planets will be very close in. Okay? Uh, and, uh, I mean, in the case of TRAPPIST-1, they're all within the orbit of Mercury, actually. They're very close in. And, and, and so you get tidal locking. One side of the planet is always facing the star. And as you know, that was considered a real problem for the aliens because one side would be hot, the other side would be cold. So cold that the atmosphere would just, you know, snow out on the on the dark side, if you will, the, the cold side, and that would be the end of life for them. Okay? But that turned out to be very naive uh, because if you have oceans or atmosphere or anything else that you might want for a habitable world, that'll carry some of the heat around to the back side and the atmosphere won't be destroyed. So all you can say is one side will be hot, the other side will be cold, but not so cold as to destroy the atmosphere. And clearly there's got to be some... some, some strip around the middle that's really great, enjoying the salubrious temperatures that you enjoy here in Atlanta, except they're not so salubrious. But, you know, if you move north a thousand miles, maybe. Okay, so, you know, and, and it, so maybe that's the answer. And that's why people today don't rule out tidally locked planets. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yes, the question is, maybe the thing to do is look farther out into space so that we're looking back in time. We're looking at societies that are more or less at our level, so maybe they're using radio. Well, to begin with, what's 10,000 years in the 13 billion year history of the universe? It's nothing, right? And, and you know, it, it, I, I think a better strategy is to say, look for the really advanced societies, actually, because they might be doing something that you could find. Right? You don't know what they're doing, but they might they be really modifying their environment. I don't mean in the sense of putting more cars on the road or anything like that. I mean that they might be rearranging their solar systems. They might be putting out a lot of heat. They may have Dyson spheres. 
So personally, I think that's a better thing than to continually or to continue to look for analogs of ourselves. That's what we do because the people who first thought of doing this were thinking in terms of, you know, the aliens are going to be all little gray guys with big eyeballs and stuff like that, or they're going to be like the aliens you see on television, which look in exactly like you do, except for more wrinkles on their foreheads, right? And there, there are billions of them living on some planet somewhere, and it's a habitable world and all that stuff. All they're doing is saying they are like us. And if you ask the trilobites 300 million years ago, who's going to be running this planet 300 million years from now? They would have said it's going to be trilobites. Right? I, I think we should be aware of that. They had enough. Probably had enough.